Eh, vi do il benvenuto da parte dell'Università, da parte del magnifico Rettore, come sempre, a questo incontro di Bocultura che oggi per me è un po' speciale perché ehm, mette insieme, per molti aspetti, il mio ruolo qui di mediatrice culturale eh, e di impegno pubblico per l'Università, ma mette insieme anche la mia ricerca, la mia didattica e il mio impegno con gli studenti che oggi sono qui e, e sono molto emozionata, sono molto emozionata perché Haumi Baba ha accettato di venire e di parlare con noi e, e quindi ve lo presento brevemente eh, dicendovi più o meno che cosa farà oggi e poi avremo una piccola conversazione e eh, tutti questi giovani che sono qui potranno Uh, fargli delle domande, chiedergli delle cose. Abbiamo appena avuto una bellissima uh, intervista, uh, seduti attorno a un tavolo, i miei studenti e lui, credo che uh, siano felici di quello che uh, generosamente Homi Baba ha risposto. Um, di Homi Baba sappiamo molte cose, non tantissime, conosciamo il suo lavoro. Um, è Anne Rodenberg Professor of the Humanities all'Università di Harvard, critico letterario, culturale, influente teorico della cultura postcoloniale. Grazie. Now I hear myself. Um, nato a Bombay nel 1949, Baba si è formato e ha insegnato nelle università britanniche, eh, prima di trasferirsi all'Università di Chicago e poi a Harvard, dove insegna nel Dipartimento di Inglese ed è direttore del Centro di Studi Umanistici Mahindra. Eh, Baba eh, ha sviluppato il lavoro di pensatori psicanalitici, post-strutturalisti, ma anche il lavoro dell'antillano francofono Franz Fanon, eh, ed è diventato una voce profondamente originale nello studio delle culture coloniali, postcoloniali, globalizzate. È autore di numerose opere, fra cui uh, I luoghi della cultura, The Location of Culture, e Nazione e Narrazione, e ha uh, libri in corso di pubblicazione, A Global Measure, con Harvard, e The Right to Narrate, con Columbia University Press. Le idee e i termini uh, influenti esplorati nei suoi saggi, quelli con cui i miei studenti, sono venuti, uh, di cui sono venuti a conoscenza durante i miei corsi, eh, e mi riferisco a ambivalence, mimicry, hybridity, in betweenness, third space. Questi sono diventati centrali eh, alla teoria critica postcoloniale, non solo, perché hanno ispirato studi di management, di architettura, eh, filosofia estetica, eh, teoria dello sviluppo e diritti umani, la teologia e molti altri campi del, del sapere. Eh, per noi la sua opera comunque rimane un riferimento essenziale per chiunque sia interessato alle prospettive culturali ibride associate al colonialismo e alla globalizzazione. Eh, la teoria critica proposta da Baba, come quella di altri teorici influenti del postcoloniale, come Edward Said e Gayatri Spivak, attinge a una gamma piuttosto imponente di riferimenti teorici, che a volte sono sembrati davvero troppo complessi da assimilare, ma Baba ha saputo elaborare per noi una serie di concetti che illuminano i modi in cui i subalterni, i colonizzati, i dannati della terra, hanno resistito all'autorità dell'Occidente, dei colonizzatori, degli imperi europei. La sua discussione di esempi tratti dall'archivio coloniale non è solo eh, storica, non ha solo rilevanza storica. Eh, L'ambivalenza che Baba rinviene nel cuore del processo della colonizzazione eh, iniziato poi nella prima modernità, consente di analizzare gli sviluppi contemporanei che vedono reti globalizzate sempre più complesse accanto a fiere identità locali che si confrontano l'un l'altra. Il suo lavoro ci aiuta a comprendere i modi in cui il colonialismo non rimane chiuso nel passato e non è finito, e invece, per usare un idioma freudiano che pervade gli scritti di Omi Baba, il colonialismo ritorna ripetutamente e misteriosamente nel presente. In effetti dovremmo probabilmente continuare a descrivere il contesto in cui viviamo come il presente postcoloniale o il presente coloniale, che implica non solo continue relazioni asimmetriche di potere, ma anche la continuazione di forme di resistenza, di negoziazione e di traduzione culturale. Oggi Baba, come vedete, attraverso le lenti dei suoi occhiali che nel, nel, nella grafica di questa bellissima locandina sono il filtro delle humanities sulle migrazioni, appunto ci parlerà 
di migrazioni, di diritti umani, di sopravvivenza e del ruolo che le discipline umanistiche hanno o possono avere di fronte a queste questioni urgenti della contemporaneità. Quindi Baba guarda alle condizioni della migrazione, allo spaesamento, al coraggio di chi è costretto a lasciare il posto dove vive e ai rischi che questo comporta. E ci porta in un viaggio che evoca il diritto di muoversi e di cambiare vita per creare un orizzonte di speranza e di sopravvivenza. Ed è un viaggio che ha anche una riflessione critica sui diritti umani, che è fatto con uno sguardo ampio sul mondo. Lui parte con il suo discorso da, dall'America populista e razzista di Donald Trump, che con Steve Bannon, il giornalista e politico ex stratega della campagna elettorale di Trump, propone uno spostamento radicale delle nostre democrazie verso una forma di nazionalismo barbarico e sovranista. Baba ne insegue brevemente lo spostamento in Europa e recentemente a Roma, dove Bannon appunto ha incontrato i nostri nuovi leader politici, che secondo lui stanno sferrando un attacco mortale al cuore dell'Europa, e poi però si concentra sul Mediterraneo. Baba evoca problemi concettuali e teorici legati all'angoscia e alla disperazione della migrazione, che sono rinvenibili in scenari geopolitici di sopravvivenza e di resistenza, quali appunto le discariche di Zarsis in Tunisia e la costa di Bodrum in Turchia, dove è finito il viaggio di un bambino siriano, Alan Kurdi, lo ricorderete, tutti l'abbiamo visto in mille foto sui media nel settembre 2015. Entrambi eh, questi luoghi sono luoghi di morte in mare, spazi del disonore in cui con cui dobbiamo fare i conti e anche che mettono a dura prova il metodo e il coraggio del pensiero critico. Baba oggi raccoglie questa sfida al pensiero umanistico e gli siamo molto grati per aver accettato di condividerla con noi. Please, Homi Baba, will you come and join me and we welcome him. I want to very deeply thank Professor Vice Chancellor Annalisa Obe for inviting me to give this lecture. Of her warmth and her brilliance and her ability to, to pose leading questions, I was well aware from mutual friends that we have. What I was not aware of, of course I should have been, is her remarkable capacity for discussion and hard work. I owe it to her that my talk today is in the shape it is, because till 1.30 yesterday morning, we were back and forth on email with her suggestions and my edits. And so, dear Annalisa, thank you. Thank you very much for your... In my view, it is that kind of intensity of intellectual exchange that allows the humanities to develop their own importance against the growth of STEM and other professional schools. And if we don't have that intensity of discussion and that integrity of discussion, which the humanities teaches us, I believe we are more lost than we know. I also want to thank uh, Signor Franco Schiavon for his hospitality and his generosity to my wife and myself. And I cannot start my lecture without reminding you that many of you will hear my rough words through the voice of a nightingale. 
Signora Vittoria, the translator. It'll sound much sweeter than it is. And I thank you, Signora, for your help. This new project of mine started when I realized that we live in a cultural and critical environment <coughs> in which the experience of death in a social, psychological, and in some ways even physical sense is very close to us. If you think about the work on climate change at the moment, <coughs> We are talking about the death of the planet, the slow death of the planet, over several millennia, and yet we have to take action conceptually and politically now. So we live in this strange situation where the question of death and life come to be deeply entangled. That so much for the uh, discourse of climate change and environmental humanities. If we think about the contemporary uh, racial situation in many parts of the world, in America in particular, we begin to see that the numbers of black lives lost on the streets, unnecessarily lost, tragically lost, have been extremely high. So in our very communities in the United States, in the very polity in which we live, life and death come very closely together. I could go on, of course, but I want to return to what is the subject of my talk today, which is the migration crisis or degrees of statelessness, where, of course, both social death and mortality come together very closely. And those of you who live in Europe recognize this more than those of us who don't. But of course, as you will know, the Mexican border is also one which suffers the same problem, what I'm going to call in this lecture the death-life condition. Thank you very much for being here and for turning out in such large numbers. The current refugee crisis in Europe, Africa, and the Middle East has made it clear that migration plays as critical a role in the moral imagination of the humanities as it does in shaping the activist vision of humanitarianism and human rights. Humanitarian intervention initiates urgent political arrangements necessary for the rescue and refuge of populations in extremis, in deep distress. Human rights laws protect the dignity and security of migrants by integrating them into a just society with provisions for pursuing the good life. The conceptual framework of the humanities is particularly, I believe, relevant to understanding the cultural and political life worlds of the migrant experience. Too often, the humanities are summoned merely as witnesses to the spectacle of the crises of contemporary life. Literature and the arts are viewed as iconic presences whose primary aesthetic and moral value lies in being illustrative of powers of empathy and evocation. Yet, the intellectual formation of the humanities, their very conception of the nature of the changes in meaning or the changes of knowledge and, and ethics is resonant with the translation of cultural norms as they are caught up in the flux of transitional lives and narratives which are part of the condition of migration. The humanities are not equipped, however, to deal with crises and emergencies with the alacrity of the law or the purposiveness, practical purpose, purposiveness of public policy. Built around pedagogies of representation and interpretation, textual, visual, digital, sonic, 
political, ideological, the humanities engage with the deep history of shifting relations between cultural expression, historical transition, and political transformations. They play a mediating role as currently discourses of representation in this three-way process. Humanistic disciplines articulate the changing relations between cultural meaning and social value as they shape civic citizens, agents, persons who participate in the creation of public opinion and the definition of what we call the public interest. Although the humanities are not activist in the traditional political sense, they are actively involved in studying the impact of the displacement of cultural values and knowledge systems as they migrate from one social context, one geographical location, or one historical context to another, moving across boundaries and establishing hybrid interdisciplinary borders of study and knowledge. Interdisciplinarity is only, I believe, properly valuable when it forms an equitable intercultural inquiry. The humanities open our moral and cultural imaginations to the imperatives of territorial displacement and intercultural translation, which are indeed the ethical conditions of the experience of migration. Migration challenges the humanities to revise not to reject, but to revise what may count as being in the national interest and compels humanistic thought to deal with altered democratic, democratic circumstances and demographic conditions. The idea that the humanities are bereft of a notion of national interest is indeed entirely wrong. The pedagogical footprint of the humanities must keep in step with the long march of migration that often runs counter to the congratulatory claims of global progress and the vanity of its utopian technological telos. The ethics of citizenship in our time are defined as much by migration and resettlement is by indigenous, local, or national belonging, as much by international governance as by national sovereignty. And the humanities play a central role in defining the terms and territories of cultural citizenship as it creates innovative educational and cultural institutions, personal and collective identities, in the making of civil society. Any curricular inquiry must confront the ethical reality that there is no outside to the global system. There are, of course, inequalities within it, injustices in relation to it, but I think the, the, the ambition of a global or international system is to suggest that there is nothing outside of it as Hannah Arendt suggests. Whatever alienates global interdependency or annihilates cosmopolitan values must unfortunately be seen to be an effect of the internal dialectic, a demonic dynamic of the global condition itself. Let me quote Arendt. Deadly danger, she says, to any global civilization is no longer likely to come from without. The danger is that a global, universally interrelated civilization may produce barbarians from its own midst, from within itself, by forcing millions of people into conditions which, despite all appearances, are the conditions of savages. As barbarism stirs in the midst of our own global vanity, and our own interconnected civilization, my friends, the barbarians are no longer at the gates. Today, the barbarians police the gates 
and the victims are too often minorities, migrants, and refugees who, in Arendt's poignant description, are only too often the oppressed, history-suffering groups. In the United States, <coughs> and more recently in Italy, Steve Bannon has become the prime proponent, in my view, of a new barbarism. And this self-description of Bannon is not mine. It is his own. In a recent interview in The Economist, Brad Bannon proudly assumed the mantle of barbarism. Speaking of the 2017 US elections, this is how he described his ideological mission. And I quote, the country, that is the US, was thirsting for change, and Barack Obama didn't give them enough. I said, we are going for a nationalist image, and we are going to go barbarian, and we will win. The description, I say, is not mine. It is his own description. We are going to go barbarian, and my dear Italian friends, I hope you don't go barbarian in the way in which we have already in the United States, in India, in Turkey, in uh, Venezuela, have gone barbarian. I hope this beautiful country and its beautiful people to whom I have a deep attachment, partly through marriage, I hope this is a country that will be saved from the barbarians. I want to suggest that barbarism, or this new nationalist barbarism, has two aspects to it. Discrimination, political discrimination, cultural discrimination on the one hand, and the language of dishonor or denigration of minorities are two faces of a barbaric nationalism mobilized to denigrate and humiliate not all minority populations, and once barbarism comes knocking at the door, believe me, nobody is safe because anybody can be put in that category. Discrimination tends to be institutional and systemic. We usually associate discrimination with rights, with inequality, injustice. For often, when we talk about discrimination, <laughs> we feel that there is a legal or quasi-legal remedy for discrimination. Dishonor, however, is verbal, visual, figurative, representational, and discursive. It tends to be informal and extra-institutional, less about rights and more about cultural representations. Dishonor is often protected by free speech and, in my view, only inadequately regulated by hate speech legislation. Barbaric nationalist discourses of discrimination and dishonor deny my minorities the capacity to be bearers of citizenly rights. And this in its time has been attributed to women, LGBT individuals. The idea is not, is simply that you don't have citizenship rights or full citizenship rights because, frankly, you're not even capable of the rights of man. The very capacity to be political, active agents is something that dishonor denies, even if discrimination legislation can be progressive to some extent. And we should not take the language of dishonor, we should take it for what it is. It is not simply a foul-mouthed president of a country sounding off. The language of dishonor exists in the corners of every place and every day. It is the everyday insult that is deeply, deeply uh, destructive of the very texture of a society. <clears throat> you could say 
that the dishonored are suspended in a precarious liminal space, often between animality and humanity, between bestiality and civility. Think how often the language of dishonor does not talk about somebody's political or civil capacities, but about their skin, their nature, their sexuality, their character assassination. Think about this and don't think it's only language. It is a very powerful discourse, I believe, in this moment of tribal nationalism. Discrimination then, I would say, relies on a biopolitics of calculation and quantification to make its case. When we are attacking questions of discrimination or dealing with them, we talk about quotas, statistics, numbers, ratios, etc. Whereas dishonor is a biopolitics of affect. It creates fear, anxiety, perpetrates often destruction and death. For all their brave talk, the lineup of inflated male leaders who dominate the world today, Putin, Trump, Erdogan, Modi, fill the blank spaces for yourselves, are not politicians of charisma. They are politicians of miasma. A fog of war emanates from their divisive ethnic nationalisms, and they rise from the conflicts they generate like saviors on a mission to make India or America or Italy great again. These movements, I believe, resonate with the character of tribal nationalism as Hannah Arendt defines it in The Origins of Totalitarianism. <laughs> Let me quote, politically speaking, tribal nationalism insists that its own people is surrounded always by a world of enemies, one against all, that a fundamental difference exists between this people and all others it claims its people to be unique, individual, incompatible with others, and denies theoretically the very possibility of a common mankind long before it is used to destroy the humanity of men and women themselves. More recently, of course, Georgia Agamben has joined forces with Arendt and returned to her thoughts on tribal nationalism to suggest that those victims of the Holocaust who were first reduced to mere existence before they were deprived of their citizenship and killed have now been replaced by refugees, minorities, migrants who repeat in their bare lives the taxonomy of the camp. The camp as a taxonomy of sovereign power even as it sunders the links between land and birth, nation and citizen, by actually having creative anti-discrimination laws, does not indeed solve the problem of what I have been calling dishonor or denigration. In Agamben's words, the camp is the fourth inseparable element that has now added itself to and so broken with the old trinity composed of the state, nation, birth, and land. Bare life, Agamben argues, is, as you know, the emergence of something like an absolute biopolitical substance that cannot be assigned to a particular bearer or subject. And because it cannot be assigned to the bearer of subject, that identity, the identity of dishonor, is always spoken for, represented by the leaders who subscribe to such ethnic tribal nationalism. At their best, I believe, my friends, that the humanities rehumanize the dishonored. They attempt to restore an equitable civic order to citizens who have been barbarianized. My talk today is written in the interests of a humanistic philology and phenomenology of the migrant crisis when the very act of survival suffers a close encounter with figures of death, loss, fear, risk, vulnerability, negation, drowning, and the void. Death, in this figurative or tropic sense, is an ethic of ironic tenacity. It is not about failure. It is about trying to resist. It is about trying to survive. 
in the face of injury and injustice. Emmanuel Levinas, alluding to what he calls the death-life metaphor, writes that it is in being answerable for the neighbor's life, it is in that sense of hospitality to be answerable for the neighbor's life that we are already with the other in death. To be answerable for the neighbor's life means that you are part of an inter interlocution with the neighbor. You are not only simply welcoming or tolerating, you are intervening, you are engaging. The side-by-side -side proximity of death life repeats in the everyday emergencies of our present history, migration, climate change, racial deaths, targeted terror, and severely tests the method and metal of our critical thinking. My lecture is written to evoke conceptual and theoretical problems related to the distress and despair of migration as they're located in different geopolitical scenarios. The first section is situated on the rubbish dumps of Tsarsis in Tunisia. My second scenario plays out off the coast of Bodrum in Turkey. Both are places of death by water. The rubbish dumps of Zarsis. Zarsis, a coastal town on the southeastern coast of Tunisia, is known for its thriving fishing industry and its prodigious olive production. Zarsis has, in the last decade, become a beachhead for beleaguered refugees from Africa, Asia, the Middle East. Syrians, Eritreans, Libyans, Ethiopians, Bangladeshis, and Afghanis head for Zarsis in their attempts to reach Tunisia's long Mediterranean coast. Refugees, like migrants more generally, soon lose their singular identities to the sovereign denomination of legal status and political designation, and they ironically are named after the very nations that have driven them into the wilderness and rendered them stateless or rightless. We talk about Syrian refugees, and they in fact have left their homes. We talk about Eritrean refugees who have had to flee, Bangladeshi refugees. Namelessly lost, names lost in life are however anonymous in death. The independent newspaper's migration correspondent writes memory, memorably of this condition. Most of the people who have been washed up in Lampedusa in recent years were there because of causes, she says, they were prepared to die for. Syrians who would die to defeat Bashar al-Assad, mothers who would die to protect their children. They did not want to die for Europe, but Europe forced them to take that risk. While politicians have felt able to lament the nameless dead, they have shown less sympathy towards the nameless living. Death's dominion, however, waits for no one. The stench of decaying foreign bodies hangs heavy in the air, and the citizens of Zarsis create a cordon sanitaire around the polluting presence of refugees dead and alive in order to protect the protesting citizens of Zarsis. The people of Zarsis refuse to admit foreign corpses into local morgues because their very existence, they feel, defiles the sanctity of the death of local families. Underfunded municipal authorities, unqualified for the task, dump the bodies on waste grounds outside the town limits. A sense of fear and revulsion surrounds the whole process, a local journalist observes, if they're brought to the hospital, the smell and fear of disease angers local citizens. Steve Saint Amour, a deep water search and recovery expert in Zarsis, looks at the dead bodies of refugees that are dumped on the rubbish wastes and draws an unforgiving conclusion. He said, you only have stateless people here. Which country has a national interest to find out what happened. Mohammed Trabelzi of the Tunisian Red Cross will not give in to Saint Amour's agitated resignation. The harsh sentence of statelessness 
delivered to the immigrant dead by national neglect cannot, in his view, be allowed to have the last word. Outraged by the rigor mortis relegated to the rubbish dumps of Zarsis, death as a kind of detritus, as rubbish, Trabelsky provocatively speaks of the dead as though they are still alive, deserving not only of proper burial rites, but of the dignity of human rights. For me, he says, these corpses are people who have human rights. They should be treated with respect, and after all, we never know how our lives can change and we can become, at some point in the future, these people. The counterfactual claim made in the declarative present tense, and this is where humanistic philology helps one, made in the declarative present tense, for me these corpses are people who now have human rights, raises an awkward and even impossible question. In what sense are corpses people who have the rights to have rights? Does the image-laden, affective language of tropes deepen our historical understanding? Or is it only some merely empathetic, emotional, linguistic description? I shall argue, on the contrary, that the language of tropes, the language of figurative speech, is profoundly important in understanding the phenomenological and ethical condition of rights. Trobelsky's figure of speech, corpses of people who have human rights, turns statelessness, in my view, from a legal and political condition into an existential and ethical imperative. The trope of bare survival, corpses as denizens of rights claims, has become a life motif of the migration crisis in both fact and fiction. Gaif, a Syrian refugee seeking asylum in Sweden, bears witness in a personal testimony to the ghostly agency of distressed migration, what we may call the act of hoping against hope. He says, right now Syrians consider themselves already dead, maybe not physically, but psychologically and socially. If the chance of making it to Europe across the Mediterranean is even 1%, then this means that there is a 1% chance of leading an actual life. Refugees and distressed migrants from a host of African countries, Libya, Ghana, Eritrea, Nigeria, dwell in a melancholic state of death life, of anomie, of anomie and apathy in Jenny Erpenbeck's, German writer Jenny Erpenbeck's migration masterwork, Go Went Gone. If you don't know it, I would really uh, uh, beseech you to read it. Go went gone, Jenny Erpenbeck. To me, it really is the, this and the last novels of John Katsia are the masterworks of this condition of refugees and migration. <clears throat> in silent protest, the characters in Jenny Erpenbeck's novel camp outside Berlin's town hall, marking their invisible presence with a written sign we become visible. Lives suspended in transit, they're victims of the Dublin Agreement, which you all know about, that treats asylum seekers as objects, not subjects, observes the jurist Goodwin Gill, the leading legal authority on the Refugee Convention and Distress Migration. Disentitled from any right to express a preference, he writes, the asylum seeker is seen as someone or something, an object, therefore to be taken back or taken in charge. Of such lives then, up and back rights. These days, the difference between the refugees who drown somewhere between Africa and Europe and those who don't is just a matter of happenstance. In this sense, every one of the African refugees here in Berlin is simultaneously alive and dead. Alive, and then there is someone who is dead, either in the family or in the community. Such a matter of happenstance, being simultaneously alive and dead, is an ontological condition with a jurisdictional history. 
Once migrants fall into the legal black holes of the migration crisis, argues the legal scholar Itimar Mann, whether on the high seas or in the SAR zone of another disintegrated state, these people are beyond every state's jurisdiction. And as Itamar Mann writes, killing typically occurs while all involved actors express their dismay and their shame and indeed their horror, but legally can avoid extending their help. And so I've given you a real life statement by Gates, the 1% possibility of survival. I've given you a fictional example, and now I'm giving you an example from the very heart of the legal discourse. Therefore, the trope of the living dead, I propose, has developed an ontological authority across diverse discourses, testimony, fiction, law, journalism, but its ubiquity must not be allowed to totalize political conditions and trajectories or sentimentalize personal tragedies. Death life is as much a condition of the agency, the will, the force of survival, as it is a resistant agency of risk, choice, and desperation, what Geith referred to as the 1% chance of living an actual life. In each of these invocations of death life, there sounds a common creed occur. How little they know those now complicit in the loss of life. And this elegiac political statement comes again from the law, from the jurist Goodwin Gill in a rebuke to what he calls the rational choice political policy thinking on deterrence and the inadequate provisions for refugee and minority protection. The language of tropes laden with effect, images, metaphors, and figures of speech plays, I believe, not simply an illustrative role, but a heuristic interpretational role in diagnosing these legal, fictional, and actual black holes or blind spots of the migration experience. Tropic language reveals a structure of disavowal that afflicts many traditions of policy thinking that resort to physical barriers like building walls, sealing borders, and policing frontiers. When, if you in fact want to protect, you have to deal with the existential and intersubjective dilemmas that emerge from the psychic trauma, the cultural subjectivity, and the powers of expression and paradoxes of personhood that create this condition. We need to shift the whole balance of policy. If we want to achieve what policy buffs say they want to achieve, if we want to understand, if we want to lessen killings, if we want to save lives, Goodwin Gill asserts, and I support, we need to think outside of the rational choice box. We need to think about the actual conditions that create this sense of fear the desire to, 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 to take the risk. We have to think much more about risk because also by thinking about risk, we will not only be thinking about the European situation, we will also be thinking about the conditions which put people at risk in their own countries. So I think risk would be a place to start thinking. Life death would be a place to start thinking about the problem of uh, uh, the problems of uh, migration, rather than to start with notions of national sovereignty, the national economy, and security, which is the way in which we have gone. In this, to support my view then, in the Mediterranean papers, the jurist Goodwin Gill said, writes, and I feel that this is a very important turning point in policy discourse. He says, whether we are thinking about sealing borders or of the many current lesser policies and practice favored by governments today, what we see time again and again is how they fail entirely to understand what is it that drives people knowingly and rationally to risk their own and their families' lives, how little they know those now complicit in the loss of life. 
only when knowledge and understanding of the despair of others, of their need to survive and of their persistent optimism, only when these factors are integrated into serious long-term policy thinking will we begin to see programs with a chance of making a positive impact, of providing proactively, not reactively, humanitarian alternatives to the present crisis on the doorstep of Europe. And I give this to you because people like me who are interested in philosophy, ethics, and literature, and culture are often told, but you know nothing about the law. That's why, dear friends, this time I'm trying to take a lawyer, the leading lawyer on refugees, at his own words and suggesting the alternative that I'm bringing to you. There are technical, legal, and administrative forms of knowledge that Goodwin Gill sees as being essential to a new European policy imposing on states a special duty of care in which the obligation not to harm is effectively translated into a positive obligation to protect. For all its formal espousal of community goals and community values, he writes, the European Union remains a congeries of dislocated and dysfunctional sovereign states, unable to contemplate working together on what is perceived perhaps as a difficult issue, touching sovereignty, security, and of course, the other. Now, for those of you who have worked with Professor Obeo on post-colonial studies will know that the notion of the other is both a rather important concept and also a rather irritating one because it is so often misused in a rather sentimental way. But I take this up from the law, this notion enunciated in policy discourse which says, and of course the other. Goodwin Gill's repeated use of the phrase, the other, brings his thinking within the ambit of the trope of death life. The problem of migration knowledge, articulated in relation to otherness, is neither information nor the call for another new savoir-faire, nor even a better intention or good practice. To seek knowledge of what it is that drives people knowingly and rationally to risk their own and their families' lives is, I believe, to demand a radical shift in the very structure of the ethical and political identification with the other. It is no longer a matter of new data or fresh information. It is here that the symbolic language of affect and metaphor, whether it informs literature, law, or raw experience, provides an unsurpassable insight into the desperate phenomenology of survival. The tropic imagination is shot through with the principle of trying to understand risk in order to prevent risk. To make risk, which has been seen as a negative concept, into a positive hermeneutic concept from which to begin to think about survival. Not security, not sovereignty, but what drives people to take the risk. And so I'm suggesting this is part of a much longer argument that we need to, in a sense, positivize the notion of, rich, of risk as a form of knowledge in order to prevent risk. This is a kind of chiasmatic you know, reversal. And I'm suggesting that it is actually important. And I'm saying that the law is tantamount to advising this, although, of course, they don't speak in the figurative, tropic, phenomenological language that I do. The tropic imagination is shot through with contradiction, irony, ambivalence, anxiety, and agonism, precisely those conditions that attend upon decisions made in taking desperate risks for what? To save a life, to preserve dignity. Dignity being, of course, the center of the human rights ideals. And yet, the Human Rights Universal Declaration does not talk about dignity in terms of the choices made in a moment of risk. Dignity for human rights is the thing we are born with. I'm suggesting to you that dignity is what we 
pull out of the jaws of death very often, sometimes more dramatically, sometimes less, when we are confronted with what I'm calling the survival situation or the death life condition. To understand what drives people to such degrees of risk, one has to start with the paradoxes of risk, of desperate optimism, the resilience of choice, the determination of despair, and the driving force of doubt. Part two, a child the size of a seabird. Another place, another death, September the 2nd, 2015. I always think that, that Giacometti really represents bare life. It represents not only the self unburdened of its civility, its citizenship, but yet trying to take another step, yet trying to be an agent. But this is what I want to talk about now. A child the size of a seabird lies dead at the water's edge, face down in the agitated surf. A Syrian Kurdish child, Alan Kurdi, is shipwrecked while traveling with his mother and brother along the Turkish coast in an attempt to enter the EU and eventually join his father in Canada. Alan's brother, Galip, lies a few feet away, and a third older child is found dead at a distance. The family had two strikes against them, writes the Ottawa citizen, illustrating what I've been calling these black holes, which are legal, literally phenomenological. Like thousands of other Syrian Kurdish refugees, the Ottawa citizen writes in Turkey, the UN would not register them as refugees, and the Turkish government would not grant them exit visas. So you can see the problem, this extraterritorial problem this, that I'm talking about, being caught in the interstices of the law where nobody needs to feel that they've done the wrong thing because juris in, 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 in jurisdictional terms, they have not. And this is, of course, the barbed wire labyrinth of law, expectation, injustice that Arendt talked about for the 30s. The first sight of a child lying still in the surge of the sea as if asleep drives you to the limit of looking and the edge of listening. There was nothing to do except to take his photograph, Nilufar Demir, the photographer says. And the camera mortis becomes the technology of testimony and the witness of ethical memory. When I came upon that image of Alan, cradled in the destructive element. In the silence, I could only hear Dylan Thomas's great poem on the death of a child by fire in wartime London. Never until the mankind making bird, beast, and flower, fathering and all humbling darkness tells with silence the light breaking, and the still hour is come of the sea, tumbling in harness. Alan Kurdi is found face down on a beach in Turkey. And as the Guardian's migration correspondent, Philip Knightley writes, and suddenly all of Europe cares. What is it about the photograph of the silent body of the child that stirs the conscience of Europe? The stillness of the ch single child as an iconic presence, dead almost before he had a life, the condition of what I've been calling death life, is all the more striking in a crisis conspicuous for the mass movements of displaced persons and the large numbers literally walking or waiting to survive a kind of freedom. The distance from Aleppo to Gaziantep over the Turkish border is 123 kilometers, and Gaziantep is a major way station for Syrian emigrants. I will try and argue that the image of this dead child's journey in cyberspace 
reimagines the globe's geopolitical space through the accelerated medium of montage. It is worth recalling that Walter Benjamin proposes that historical understanding is to be grasped in principle as an afterlife, the evidence is before you, and follows it up a couple of paragraphs later with a recommendation that in a moment of emergency, the first stage in undertaking the history of emergency would be to carry over the principle of montage into the construction of history. Now, I'm afraid I cannot give you the larger theoretical justification, but I didn't want to lose the point. We can talk about it later, but I think this is a very interesting issue in Benjamin when he says the problem even of certain Marxist or idealist histories is that they always want to have an epic narrative and architecture leading to a kind of teleology. But he says, in, as far as he's concerned, he says, the literary style of montage, when it is brought in to the display, the writing of histories of urgency, of the kind I'm talking about, histories of desperation, the shock of the montage, the clash of the montage, says more than any continuous narrative can. Public opinion and public policy may well be served by the acceleration of the digital image and its rapid circulation of global information, what is referred to as news content tagged to a relevant image. And that is what was seen to be so remarkably um, uh, important about this one image, which made, as you know, the whole EU meeting come sooner. I mean, thousands were dying. The week before this, in Amsterdam, in somewhere in, yes, somewhere in Holland, they discovered a large truck which had been parked for days. You'll remember, there were 35 rotting refugee bodies locked up just the week before this. And yet this singular image, of which we can discuss, somehow shakes people up. And this is the kind of, I want to talk about the image, but I also want us not to, uh, to be careful about the sentimentality that is so easily projected on a dead child when thousands of others are dying. However, there is, I believe, a cultural and political lesson to be learned from the radical change in the shape of the diffusion of the image, which forces us to reconsider the question of ethical and aesthetic value in the quantitative count of what is called the huge influx of news content. Circulation, I believe, is not the only problem. Oh, circulation, indeed, is what people say makes an image global, engages the hearts and souls of many. I feel that circulation is not really the only issue, and large numbers is also not the only issue. Think, this is a singular image of one child which somehow shook the conscience of Europe. The form of the circular, circulation of the image is crucial, I believe, to its political and its affective uh, response. Having just talked about affectivity, having talked about the notion of honor, the notion of rehumanizing. The global, the global circularity of the image is less, I believe, a matter of news content then it is a significant issue of cultural form. The impact of Alain's iconic image cannot only be calculated in terms of the speed and scale of information, tweets, and posts, without turning our attention to the medium that shapes the attention of a global audience. The iconographic translation, which in the technical language is called remediation, repeatedly restructures our identification with the image of Alain, and this image went global in a series of remediated images which were montage-like. If you can see, not only is the child placed in a context, but there is an attempt to place the child, rudely insert the child, to place the child not in a naturalistic uh, scenario, but to place the child as awkwardly as possible, as indeed you have in the juxtaposition of montage. So let's look at the first. This is the um, manipulation. 
laid out on, uh, sorry, laid, this is the manipulation of Assad, uh, of, the, of the child placed in the midst of the Gulf sheikhs. The, sh the Gulf accepted the least amount of refugees. So this is a manipulated image by some anonymous maker which circulated right through the sphere, the cybersphere. This image shows the child laid out on the Assad celebratory table. Alan's dead body here is not the same there, although you can see the disruption of scale, the montage quality. This is the dead child citizen as a sacrificial lamb, the blood price of a failing state in the throes of a dynastic tyranny, the child as the plaything of the global superpowers in their unenlightened self-interest. Laid to rest on the EU conference table, Alain's body is the child refugee, claiming his rights of asylum, making a plea for a more humane system of refugee protection, and seeking some redress for periods of detention that can last from two to nine years. The members of the EU and the UN turn away from Alain's body in a derogation of their human duty and in a moral act of disavowal. Laid against the opulent, towering skyline of Dubai and Qatar, Alain's body is an ethical measure of the radically unequal and unfair treatment meted out to refugees across the countries of the Middle East and the Gulf. Compared to the remarkable efforts in Turkey, which must not be denied, Lebanon and Jordan, the response in the Gulf states, as in the United States, has been derisory. Turkey, roughly about uh, two million and a half, Lebanon, one and a half million, Jordan, 664, the US, now a little more than 10,000, and the UAE, 663. Political montage is an incongruent composition of conjoined contradictions, social, visual, and unanticipated associations. And indeed, as I hope I have shown, each narrative was quite specific in its intervention and in its framing of the problem. Each one, as I read, dealt with a specific aspect. It was not simply the child laid out in a global stage. Montage, I believe, is a chiasmus. It places you in a dilemma at the crossroads, rung by rung, day by day. Alain's montage body, child citizen in one image, child refugee in another, asylum seeker in a third, moral measure in a fourth, is the afterimage of the life of distress migration. The child's corpse lying across the shoreline brings us face to face <clears throat> with the dialectical tension of natality the moment of being born, and fatality, the moment of death. And indeed, in these manipulations, in each one of them, just as in the legal creed occur, when Goodwin Gill says, how little do they know of risk, those who write policies, we are now brought face to face with the figure with which I started death life. As a juxtaposition of concepts and conditions, natality and fatality signifies an emblematic montage in its own contradictory constellation. Natality is not a naturalistic moral virtue, nor is fatality governed simply by fate. In the human condition, Hannah Arendt gives natality a capacious symbolic meaning resonant with the intimations of the afterlife of migration. To be born again at another's time and in another's place from within the womb of death by water or land, which Gaith reminds us, as you will recall in my start of my talk, is a compelling necessity, even if it carries only a 1% chance of survival. The destruction of natality in death, drowning, living death, 
bare life or mere existence is not simply the extinction of life. It is, as I have tried to argue, about the desperation of life's choices and the decision to snatch whatever shred of dignity is available in the moment of risk and survival. It is with something like this in mind that Muhammad Trabelzi spoke sternly of the ethics of migration in a way that turns the dim and distant conditions of the future into a horizon for the present. These corpses, he said, are persons who have human rights. And as we look at this final image of a horizon that cuts across the borders and frontiers with, indeed, the barbed wire labyrinth, it signifies a world in which we live today, where the vulnerability and valor of our very home own human condition is both under threat, but it is also a sign of the profound optimism that there exists in human life itself. Many thanks. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. It was dense. It was enlightening. Uh, it was also very powerful. Um, the three things go together. I don't feel like I want to say much because you've said so much. And um, whatever question comes now uh, seems quite silly to me. But I want to just say two or three things and then let the people here uh, intervene and ask questions and make comments um, and see how it goes. Um, you, you have interwoven very skillfully discourses of law, of literature, experience around the trope of the living dead, uh, which implies despair, risk, survival. And this certainly draws a very complex picture of the way the humanities can tackle the refugee predicament, the, the migrant crisis, and, and work towards restoring some measure of humanity and, and agency. Um, so I guess that, that, that is what we are um, trying to, to understand through what you said. But I want to stay... In, uh, for a moment on Lizen Alan uh, Kurdi, because I think the images were so powerful that they, they resonate deeply uh, in a moving, very moving way. Uh, I think it, it, they affected us all. Mm? So you speak about the migrant's death uh, by drowning, in, in this case, um, not as the extinction of life. Okay. Um, and, and you say that it is the decision to take the risk of survival which signifies, at the same time, the vulnerability of being human, but also the courage, the boldness, the valor of our own human condition. So by taking Alan uh, or Alan uh, as the, uh, and the different representations of the story, you make a case not only for uh, more empathy, unconditional identification, the predicament of, generally, let's call them the wretched of the earth, um, but also explain how photography and the digital media are or may become instrumental. Uh, first, to reimagine the geopolitical space of the globe through effective relations, and second, 
uh, to provide through this kind of montage that you've explained, narratives of afterlife that are political. Mm? And as such, they contain potential for intervention. And, and when we reach that stage, um, of course, one always asks, uh, how does one move from there to the legal and the practical task of international legislation, action, and resistance? In, in some way, you've responded to this. But I, I would like you to perhaps, uh, would, or if we can put it another way, how have, have the representations of Alan's death had the power, or will they have the power to influence international law? Uh, it's going beyond the uh, beyond tropic language, beyond uh, you know the moving outside the rational in order to get to different stages of understanding. Yeah. Maybe. Hello. Yeah. No, I think that's a, um, a, a very fair and important, uh, a very fair and important point. Now, we know in practical terms, and the world's press wrote about it, that for for reasons that we could actually question, it had a tremendous impact. Uh, now, how long that impact lasted, uh, we can't say, but it definitely showed up some of these legal blind spots, as I've been calling them, and people have tried to work on them. That, that is clear. The actual, I think your question demands a very concrete answer, and the concrete answer is to how the Alan Kurdi event actually changed the law to date I cannot, I cannot say, but, but let's say that my interest was to change another preconception, the preconception that it is actually the circulation of the image and the quantification of how it circulates that makes it global. I'm against these kinds of definitions of the global, where the more you have the, a thing is global. You know, the more it reaches out, it doesn't work. So I'm saying that what makes it global was this kind of montage-like remediation, which would not have been possible without the technology. And I'm using the term montage here. It's, an, it's a, a, a longer argument, I'm aware, but I hope I've said enough to say why I think it's important. And that re, those remediations, those interventions by people, on which there is a large study, by the way, done at the University of Sheffield, that, I think, makes a change in people's actual um, uh, 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 acting upon the world, as Gramsci would call it. Not only being in the world, but that whole Gramscian notion of elaboration you know, of elaborating the world. And that's what I want to say here. But since we're now in Italy, there is a, was another case, the Hersey case, where the Italian government uh, sent back, well, you know the Hersey case, sent back the, this group of people on a boat, they sent them back to Libya, uh, uh, and, and it, it's a very famous case. And that case has had you know, it's exactly a case on which you could do the Alain Cordy cinematic, photographic, uh, montage analysis. And that has, of course, had lasting influence on basically on two issues. <clears throat> One, that there is no extraterritorial space. You know, that all these extraterritorial spaces in the middle of the sea here, that these are not actually legally extra you And the Italian government was actually taken to task for not, for sending people back to, to Libya. And that, that, that notion that they were in some kind of free space was not right. So that was one real implication. And it has changed the notion of protection and care. And the second one, from a, 
humanistic point of view that I found very interesting uh, was the idea that um, collective expulsions of people, group expulsions, you cannot say to send people away as a whole group without assessing each case. Now, either you can understand that as a kind of case-by-case -case casuistry of the law, that the law always depends on a case, or from my perspective, that notion of taking each story and assessing it is a form of judgment that, that, that impedes the generalizations around jurisdiction. It actually introduces a difference into the law. It, it, it's, so in a, in a way, it's not only about every individual story, but the archive of individual stories suspends the judgment of the law. It introduces another time and another mode of deliberation. And that mode of deliberation is capable not of immediately changing the law, although it did, but of showing up the ethical and indeed the way in which ethical and legal issues can sometimes come together. And the purpose of that, from my point of view, is both the interest in narrative as a humanist, but also in, in the interest of the, this temporality of judgment, which is different from the more functionalist or rationalist temporality of judgment. Do you see what I'm saying? It's, it's suspended judgment makes you think, puts you in a place where you, we, where you cannot simply go with the orientations of the law as given. To put it, this is a much longer argument, but what it makes you do is to think of fairness in the context of justice, if I just might put it that and way. And to doubt. And doubt, absolutely. That is the deliberative moment, yeah. Yeah, thank you, that was a good question. Thank you. There's legal scholars here, human rights scholars that might want to say something on this. Uh, but I will just ask you two brief questions. Uh, you talked about discrimination and dishonor. Hmm? Discriminazione e disonore. Um, and you said that when you have discrimination somehow, uh, you can intervene legally or you almost, have the hope, almost, yeah. you, you, you can do something against discrimination. Uh, so there's a remedy which is a legal remedy uh, if you are discriminated or if you are in a society that discriminates. But what do you do with dishonor? What is mm. the remedy of dishonor? Well, um, meaning the, yeah. the, the real menace to your dignity yeah, as yeah, a human yeah, being. Yeah, yeah, yeah. They were, that's, again, a, a very important question. I wanted in this instance to make the distinction between dis discrimination and dishonor. I hope that was clear, because very often people think that if you get rid of discrimination, you get rid of the language of dishonor. Uh, the language of discrimination is, in a way, about equality. That's why I said that it at least gives you some kind of legal, or as I put it, quasi-legal hope. Uh, the language of discrimination is about difference. And the language of dishonor is about difference. And of course, the two can come together. They can, you know, be used uh, like, a, like a millefeuille to put one on top of the other and uh, to mask the other two. I think, you know, Joseph Conrad said all of Europe was responsible for Kurtz. And I would say, all of our universities, given that we are in a university, are in a way responsible for um, not um, uh, emphasizing enough, although we, I know we try hard, the importance of language and the harms of language, and also, of course, the highs of language. I'm not being pessimistic here. And I'm saying, therefore, that I think that it has to begin here. Uh, of course, uh, it has to begin in schools. It has to begin in universities. It has to begin with a respect for rhetoric. And I feel quite comfortable saying it in a university of this 
tradition in this age, you know, of this university that goes back however many, 800 years, where ret and, you know, rhetoric was a very important issue. So I feel that to show people that rhetoric is actually an ethical act, in our classrooms, when we discuss difficult issues, where we feel that insult may occur, you know, to show, in fact, in the class itself, that there are ways of deliberation and dialogue across very difficult matters that do not need to result in this kind of binaristic uh, uh, polarities of, um, uh, 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 of um, uh, the most insulting kind as we see it now as a public discourse in many countries. So I really think that this is about civic education. Uh, and, and it's, but it's about the power of language and discourse. And you know, the more people think in more instrumental terms about the, uh, the uh, about outcomes uh, and about uh, uh, the, the use of technologies, and the less people are able to talk about interpretation, uh, then I think this is a this is a real problem because it seems to me that um, in a world of increasing information, the real task of reading now, the real task of making knowledge, is through interpretation. And we talk about the rights of free expression, which I think, frankly, and of course in America, this is a, uh, this is a complete uh, mania that, you know, the freedom of speech, everybody should have the right to say whatever they want without the question of what power that speech has or where it's coming from or the inequalities. You know, it's a kind of a, uh, a, an American exceptionalist idea, which I don't go with, uh, of, of kind of a f American um, national myth, but I do, I think that the right to interpret, and there is no such thing as a right to interpret, there's a right to free speech. And I've been arguing the work I've, some of the work I've done at UNESCO, et cetera, with the past director general, not the new one, that the, the, the stakes of interpretation, the ethical and institutional stakes of interpretation are extremely important. I can't say more about this. I can just say one matter as a question of principle. You know, at the University of Chicago now, they have what they call the Chicago Protocols or the Chicago University um, recommendations to which they get many universities to sign up, which is really about free speech. They say that you should have, that you can have the withering criticisms and their university is there to have the most withering, even wounding discussions. And that's the robustness of the university. Uh, of course, I was taught at Chicago. In fact, it's a wonderful place, and it's a place of great civility, because people take discussion and interpretation hugely seriously. But m everybody takes their gloves off at Chicago. You know, it's not a cuddly wuddly place, I can assure you. But having said that, I wrote back, the president, who's a friend of mine, sent me this thing, and I said, this is very interesting. But I have said in the same context that we need something like interpretational good practice. I'm quite happy to have somebody tear my argument to pieces. Of course, I would rather that they did it kindly rather than savagely. But I'm quite happy to have that if I've done the work myself. But I have to be able to recognize the veracity of my position in what is being attacked. Do you see what I'm saying? I'm now I'm elaborating this idea as interpret, it came out of a private correspondence, but now I've been elaborating, it's called interpretational good practice. I don't mind you disagreeing. But once you take the effort to understand and interpret and know that it is a demand, how we impose that demand, I don't know, but that in every respectable discussion it will occur, that you will be able to understand what I am actually pulling apart as your own, then I think dishonor and denigration will be checked 
to some extent. But I do think the important thing is for people to understand the great power of language, both for hope and for harm. Thank you. I think it's all yours now. <laughs> Your turn. Um, unless, have you got questions ready? Any of you? I'd rather not go on asking questions because it's your turn now. Well, let me ask you one last personal question and then maybe someone will... Oh, there's a hand there. Okay. Uh, you need a mic. Is this in Italian? Uh, yes. Vorrei capire meglio cómo fue el paragón entre el problema de países latinoamericanos con la Turquía o con la Libia en confronto de la inmigración. Visto que los países latinoamericanos son una colonia americana, entonces el degrado nuestro eh, en confronto de los países ricos eh, no, no, le, no le capisco cuando le hago este tipo de, eh, de información, tipo Venezuela, porque para países democráticos, para virgolete, habíamos la, el, la Colombia, que ha habido una guerra de 20 años tras fratelli, el México, por ejemplo, o sea, la minoranza indu, eh, eh, indígena no valgo no niente, casi, en confronto de la oligarquía criolla. Entonces, eh, o sea, Haití. Por ejemplo, ahora, ¿cómo me fa el, el paragón de la América Latina con qué tipo de degrado? Um, I did not compare migration systems in, 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 in fact, I did not talk at all about Latin American migration. I didn't talk at all about the U.S. migration. I didn't talk about migration. Um, I talked largely about the Mediterranean, so I did not actually do that. What I did say was that there was a kind of tribal nationalism, a tribal nationalism and a tyrannical form of uh, governance emerging at the same time in a number of countries. Here, the question is much more about the rights of minorities and not the rights of migration. I did not make the comparison, my friend. It is, in fact, in your question to me that you made these various comparisons just now. I only talked about a particular form of um, a nationalism that has emerged with many shared characteristics, and I really don't think that that is controversial. I also think that it is not controversial that in the countries I cited, there is a continual use of denigratory and dishonorable language to those who are seen to be minorities. In, 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 in Turkey, for instance, they're not all the same. In India, you have it against Muslims and the untouchables and Christians in the same kind of denigration based on what I call tribal nationalism, or through, you know, in, in my uh, uh, reading of Arendt. In uh, Turkey, you have it against Kurds, uh, you have it against Armenians, and the whole history of the Armenians, and you have it against uh, in all dissidents. Uh, what is it? Are there 400 academics in, now in prison in Turkey, something like that? Four, in Turkey, 400 academics were dissidents who had been locked up for signing a single product, what do you call it, a, 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 a single letter about the Kurds. Um, um, so I, I never compared migration, but I talked about the widespread, um, the widespread um, form of uh, certain kinds of tribal nationalism. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Baba. Uh, Claudio Padovani from here, the university. Um, thank you very much. I think it's fascinating, this focus on discourse. Uh, Can you speak just a little louder? Yes, yeah. yes, you yes, can hear. <laughs> it's just not easy to... Um, so, uh, me, myself, being interested in communication, media, and communication rights. 
and your reference to interpretation as something that should be recognized as a right sounds very much like this uh, broader concept of communication rights that we need, uh, which goes much beyond uh, freedom of expression, yes. including the right to be listened to. So there, there's a whole... Uh, right to, sorry? To be listened to. Yeah, to listen to, absolutely. So there, there's a, a recent evolution of this idea of how communication relate to human rights. But in that sense, I think, uh, and, I, and I do agree with your concern with how we think of uh, STEM and technology in a very technological driven kind of perspective, I think if we look at communication in this broader sense, uh, we can't really um, give like a rapid uh, and kind of only critical perspective on, on technology and the media. Because even if we are to revise uh, the very ways in which we do conduct interpretation, these technologies are going to be there. And we also see that there are so many positive uh, um, experiments that needs to be supported uh, instead of criticized. So I, I wonder what is your take in this? So, socio-technical is not just about us being driven by technology, but it should be much more us driving the way technology is going to be designed. I have, um, sorry, what did you say your name was? Claudia. <laughs> Signorina or Signora Claudia, whatever. Let me just say that I have no conflict with that at all. And of course, communication in the broadest sense uh, and the, te the techne of communication, the technologies of communication would absolutely fall within my rights of interpretation idea. But I, I am saying that the complexities of interpretation the ethical complexities of interpretation. One of is the right to listen, but also how the Speech Act itself is an interlocutory invocation of another. The whole phenomenology, I think, has not yet, at least from my understanding, that there are versions of that phenomenology, but it has not taken root. The question really is where to start. What do you start from? And I would feel that the connection between ethical, rhetorical, phenomenology, and language in the broader sense, I'm not just talking about linguistics, I'm talking in the broadest communicational sense, indeed, as you are. I think that really needs to have a much broader base across universities. That's what I'm arguing for, not at all do I, how would I think that a STEM would not be involved in interpretation? Of course it's been involved in interpretation. But we did talk earlier with our students in the student group about something, which is that, and please correct me, you, uh, that in a way, uh, humanistic interpretation very often has a different temporality that one is continually having to make the judgment, you know, of what is the ethical valence of this. You don't have an experiment which you want to come to the end of and then you assess. It's a continual ongoing process. And I think that I need to develop that, I know, but I think there is a different temporality in the interpretation in the humanist, generally humanistic field uh, it is to do with repetition, iteration, the, the, the fact that memory is in a way, in any humanistic interpretation, memory is what stops history from becoming presentist. Memory is what allows the future in a way to be proleptic. All these, you know, rather technical, cultural, linguistic, phenomenological concepts uh, I feel need to reach out much more. So it's not to say that STEM or communications, you know, does not have the problem of interpretation. I'm only talking about enriching that problem. And at the Humanity Center at Harvard that I direct, in fact, this is one of my main efforts. We have now the medical humanities, we have environmental humanities, we have um, uh, um, anthropological uh, work together with technology. So we do a number of these things. And the effort is to bring 
to build a bridge. You know, the other great thing about the humanities, I think, in terms of interpretation, is that we don't judge our success on the basis of models. We judge our success on the making of communities. On the making of communities. And making communities is so much about what you call the right to listen or what I call the right to interpretation. So I'm very much with you. I hope I didn't come out as attacking. I didn't mean to attack. All I meant to do was to enrich that dialogue. Thank you so much. Um, thank you very much for your um, very brilliant presentation. Uh, you began by mentioning uh, climate change oh, as a... a little slower. Yes, yeah, sorry. Uh, you began by mentioning climate change uh, as a problem that will uh, tackle uh, the life of the planet. But uh, before it will kill the planet, of course, it will affect the life of millions of people and, and kill many of them. And uh, I would like to ask you uh, what... That's a splendid question. I think very much about this problem. Uh, of course, in the 35 or 40 minute presentation, I was not able to deal with it. Do you think about the notion of uh, climate refugee or um, environmental refugee? that sometimes is used in the uh, legal field to uh, frame the problem? Uh, yeah, that's my question. Thank you very much. That's, uh, I think it is a fundamental issue. Uh, and I think it's a fundamental issue because um, the movement of people, for, two re for this reason, that the degradation of the environment, right, will not choose its victims. It's a world system. And very often, look what's happening in the United States now. There is such climate change denial that people who want to come to the United States because they think that they can have a better life and will find that they're entering a, a danger zone. And this will happen in other parts of the world. India is also one of these. But so crucial do I think is uh, environmental refugees uh, that Indeed, it has made people think that the central problem with the, uh, with, the, with the law around refugees and the ethical law around refugees, which is the notion of protection, right? The, you know, the refugee convention is very much about the protection, that that should now be changed to displacement. That really the threat now is not so much protection, but displacement. And indeed, climate change refugees are very central to that, to that change in thinking from protection to displacement. So I take that very seriously. Also, uh, just two other things. One, we talk about the death of human beings, but what about the death of animals? That, I think, is an extraordinarily significant issue. The death of animals, much earlier necessarily, and the animals do not have the same, I mean, depends which, but many animals cannot, you know, take the long march. So I think that's a, 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 very, a very important aspect. The real problem is, again, a humanistic problem. You can see how I'm, I'm batting for the humanities, you know, in this football game or in this game of baseball or whatever it is, I'm trying to bring in the humanistic issue. I think the other way in which uh, the humanities can actually assist in thinking about things like climate change is how do we make a commitment now to something which will have its most tragic consequences after our deaths? You know, that's one problem. I'm not saying that there aren't uh, degradations now. But, I, but the larger question is, how do you do that? How do I make the ethical commitment now to that which at some point in the future might be my condition, but I will not be there for that future? And I think one way of thinking about that futurity is the way in which people often think about the past and keeping the past alive. You know, if we could think about keeping the future alive, which is an awkward formulation, we might be able to learn from what it means to keep the past alive. Now, of course, 
we assume that the past is dead, which is why we have to keep it alive, or it's potentially dead. We don't think the future is dead. But I am putting this awkward formulation for you to think, that as we think of the past being, uh, bringing the past to life, the only way to commit ourselves ethically, politically, scientifically, is to think about bringing the future to life. Does that respond? Thank you. Yeah. Yes, ma'am, in black. Thank you, my name is Mariana Parlati. I teach British literature, and I work on vulnerability, trauma studies, disability studies, and a number of very wonderful, pleasant issues. First of all, I want to thank you for this very demanding talk, and it's always important to be engaged in conversation, so thank you for that. And of course, thank you to Annalisa, who actually managed to bring you here with us. You, I'm delighted um, to be here with you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank um, you me. I, I would like to actually, I, I have a question for you and a comment. Just a few months ago, we had a conference here on slow violence, which of course tended to tie together uh, climate change, um, environmental issues, asylum seekers especially. Um, we had the pleasure of having another very important international scholar. His name is Joseph Pugliese. I'm not sure whether you are... Joseph? Pugliese. Are you familiar with him in any way? I was actually very impressed by, of course, the, the, the pictures that you showed. He also worked on asylum seekers in the context of the Mediterranean. And... He really shocked, I think, I think, if I remember correctly. He shocked us by suggesting that um, we actually forget the very simple, banal fact that the bodies that we see are just a few of those who actually drown in the seas. And that very likely, uh, the huge, the large fish actually do, in a way, feed on them. And eventually, by proxy, we also feed on their own bodies. So in a way, and this I think ties in with your uh, attempt at thinking back on biopolitical issues, of course, and also zoopolitical issues. In a way, animal life is so relevant. We are animal anyway. So, uh, And that was very impressive, actually, thinking that we may be feeding on human meat, which is amazing, but in a way, how can you not agree? Uh, how would you know? Uh, as much as we feed on plastic, possibly debris is whatever it is. So that, that's the comment in a way, but I was actually wondering whether you had a, ever been thinking about that. That is very demanding, but the question is another, because I was very impressed by the fact that you conclude on a very positive note. I'm so happy that someone can be nostalgic. And actually, I'm also very impressed by the fact that you use words which seemed to have been forgotten in political and academic relance, one being honor and dishonor. You didn't mention honor, but we take that in a way for granted. And of course, it means so much, but we never really hear it. But the question, um, the question is very banal, possibly, and very stupid, possibly. While you were thinking and you were talking about remediation, I was, I was talking about what, sorry? Remediation. remediation. Yes. Um, I was thinking back on remedy. And would you say that those attempts, of course, there would be many others, and I'm sure once you start Googling, uh, you, you find hundreds of thousands of other versions. Uh, would you say that remediation can be taken as a form of atonement or as a kind of political action? Or would you say that is, in a way, stretching it a bit too far? Thank you know, um, that's, um, I would go here with you as, with that it may have been, it could have been, of the remediation could be a kind of remedy. But I think it is not about atonement. Here I think the nature of, the, of these images, which come from very, very different places, is a desire to repair a tear in a kind of global social contract, or what should be a global social contract, it doesn't exist. And it was, I think, to show up the 
the the the the kind of the kind of uh, asymmetries in a very dramatic way not to 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 confront you to confront you with the this montage like problem of asymmetry now the interesting thing i think about montage um, and this is a, is the way in which the temporality of montage is a confrontational temporality. Montage puts cause after the confrontation. Usually we are, th we are used to thinking about the causality. Sorry, we're used to thinking about the causality and then constructing either the argument or the image or whatever. Montage throws the causal question out first to bring it back later. And I think that's actually very interesting. Here I'm again reminded of my guru, Walter Benjamin, um, who said, you know, that it is important in a historical discussion to start from something which is out of place, not something which always clicks in to the sequence. And I think that those, those works do that. They create the confrontation, and then they make you return. That's why in my explanation of it, I tried to keep away from any sentimentality that this is the death of, you know, I said what I had to say, but then it was to show how each remediation, how each mise-en-scene had a very specific confrontation. And out of confrontation, of course, you can have remediation or remedy. But it was not atonement as I would see it. Thank you very much. In, in the last part, you have emphasized the issue of Alan, and uh, possibly why we emphasize so much with this issue is that uh, we feel that he did not have a fighting chance, while we do not even uh, realize that neither the 99% remaining didn't have mm, a fighting chance also. And since you quoted uh, Dylan Thomas at this point, there is another brilliant poem by him which says something along the lines of, do not go gentle into that into the dark night. night. Rage, rage before the dying of the it, light. Yeah. Exactly. So in my read of the poem, he, he tells us to act, to fight. Mm, my question is, my possibly very utopic question is, and maybe it deserves just a utopic answer, is in your opinion, what are the steps towards changing that 1% not only into a 2, a 5, a 10, or even a 99%, but what are the steps to take to annihilate completely that death life uh, condition of which you have spoke of? Um, well, first of all, let me just say that the, the poignancy of that image, I would disagree with you, is not about that he had no hell in, a, a chance in hell, but that he actually had a chance. He had a chance. That's what makes that whole thing so powerful that everybody who enters that, the boat thinks they have that one chance. That's the real, or that's the issue to really think about, that everybody thinks they have a chance. That is the kind of optimism. I called it a dark optimism. I called it a ghostly optimism, but that's, that's the issue. You know, I think that I ca here I sound like uh, a, a, a bad version of Hannah Arendt, but let me say, I think that till we have nation state systems across the world, it's going to be very difficult not to have, not to put those who are deemed to be minorities, and that can change, you know? That can change. Those who are deemed to be minorities 
it's going to be very difficult, large numbers or small, not to put them in what I call the death life condition. In fact, that's one of the really um, one of the, 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 the central thoughts in the um, origins of totalitarianism, where Arendt says that in every, in almost every condition, historically, where nations have been formed, there have always been expulsions, there have always been refugees, there have always been minorities. They don't always have to be thrown out, they can be within, the enemy within. And uh, she sees it, I think, as a certain a condition of modernity. And if you, and she writes, uh, you know, people don't usually pick up, but she writes, it, look what happened in Palestine, you know. Here was somebody who felt that uh, the hospitality of the Jewish um, idea of return was destroyed as soon as the state was founded. You know, she says, as soon as the state was founded, that idealism went. She talks about India, you know, where India and Pakistan, you know, six million, what, I forget the figure, but six million refugees. So I think it's going to be very difficult, and it seems to me to be more and more difficult at the moment. Uh, I, I, you know, living in between, uh, of course I visit Europe a lot, but I live, bet I live between India and the United States. And uh, in both places, you wake up every day, and in India actually particularly, because caste and, and minorities and is such an important issue. You know, ev almost every day you wake up, and across the newspapers, there are these um, um, violations uh, 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 against minorities, based sometimes on religious faith, sometimes based on uh, customary, what are, what are seen to be, um, uh, you know, customary uh, uh, violations of, of habit. I mean, you know, in India we now have these cow vigilantes, young gangs running around the country, um, often murdering, burning uh, Muslims or, or untouchables because Muslims like supposedly eat lots of beef and untouchables who work in the leather industries because they're, uh, uh, they're not, you know, because of their caste very often can't work in other ways that apparently, I mean, just think about this scenario, you know, when, when that, that Muslims are running around killing cows knowing that they are their own lives are vulnerable and untouchables are going around killing cows because they need the leather to work on leather. I mean, when you read this, you really begin to think about that other great statement made by Walter Benjamin where he said, instead of thinking about determinate causalities, what materialist history needs is to bring surrealism into historical thinking. I'm not, you know, I'm not saying this is a joke. You read the papers that, you know, apparently Muslims are going around killing cows, knowing that they will be burnt, knowing that the, it, it just doesn't make sense. But you see, you see it all the time. And Christians are always converting. They have nothing else to do but to go around converting, knowing that they will be killed. So it seems to me it's very difficult for me to think at this point, I could, uh, of, of, of a complete shift to the 100%, as you put it, in a very touching way. I mean, we could, we could say all kinds of things about democratic institutions, civil society. Uh, uh, we could say a number of, I could say a number of very good, sensible things, but I'm not going to do it. I'm going to leave you depressed for the moment. Is that? Yeah. I think that's the last question. Time's almost up. Thank you. So I would like to go back to the problem that if representation has the power to influence international law. And I go back to your quotation by a lawyer, can't remember the name, sorry, and you, who said, how little do they know about risk, those who write policy. Are we sure that the problem is not that they, they are taking risk seriously? 
they know what you said, that risk is the expression at the same time of the vulnerability of human uh, being and of the sign of optimism. So they know that, the, that risk is the expression of humanity. This is why lawyers and politicians are constructing walls, are letting people die in the sea. So I would assume that it's because they know risk that they try to stop migration, but they don't know that you will never stop migration. But Correct. they know that risk is the expression in both. You, you have said mm -hmm. that perfectly. I mean, now everyone is using your vulnerability. I mean, everyone is studying vulnerability. But what you said, I think, is the expression of vulnerability. Taking risk is both a sign of optimist and a sign of our vulnerability. But it's exactly because international law is not up there. We do international law. So they know that risk is what they want to take seriously. It's just no, no. It's a very no. It's a good point. But I'm just saying when he says that, you know, this is Goodwin Gill, who's written the the major work on the Refugee Convention, looking at all the history, the travel preparatoire, and has recently written. It. So he, I think, speaks beside you and me. He is putting this very ironically. He's. Why I used the Mediterranean papers, which I think are really worth reading, they're very accessible and they're worth reading, is because the notion of risk, of course, I've done a lot of work on it. Huh? You know, I've beaten the eggs a lot. So I'm not saying that he would have the same phenomenological or, or ethical perspective, but I think it's compatible. But when he says, if only they knew I think he is actually being ironical. He's not simply being elegiac, you know. It's not that, you're absolutely right. They do it because they know it. But, therefore, there is, by, by using what I call the figurative language, it, there is a way of actually showing how even within the law, literature, journalism, there are these spots, these moments, and we can make the linkages, whereas the politicians or the disciplinary lawyers will not want to do it. So I, I, this is a kind of a counter discourse in this way. In fact, I had a line here uh, that uh, I put very provoc provocatively, and my wife, who's a human rights lawyer and teacher at Harvard, you know, she, uh, when I was writing some things on the plane, she said, no, 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 you know, it doesn't sound right at all. And I'd said, instead of, <laughs> this is how I first put it, instead of saving, instead of making such a noise about saving life, maybe we should turn the language and say, you should save death. You see, I said that and I had it in the text and she said, no, saving death doesn't sound right at all. And I thought, She's much more sensible than I am, so I better not use it. But I'm going to find that, do you see what I'm saying? I'm going to find, because they say, all this is but protection about saving lives, and then they let people die, I'm just, I want to work this out, even in a sloganish way. Don't talk about saving life. And I don't just want to say, talk about preventing death, because that has got no, you know, no pizzazz in it. But I want to say something like that. If you think about saving death, in a sense, then you would be able to save lives. And that's the whole point of my talk, that by turning the taking risk, which is what we want to avoid, as a kind of positive ground uh, of constructing uh, a sense of legal ethics, we might be in a better place. Does that make sense to you? Thank you. Thank you for your questions. Thanks, everybody, for being Thank here. You. Thank, Thank you. Thank you for your you questions. Thank you so much. I'm delighted. Thank you. You've got this larger audience at a late hour. This is the interest for what you said. Thank you so much. Thank you all for coming. Thank you very much for your hospitality. Thank you.